Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I really appreciate your taking the effort to join us today for this uh, institute for the Building Energy for a Sustainable Tomorrow. Um, I want to just start by asking how many of you, let me ask how many are new? How many have never been here? A lot. Wow. Great. Okay. So um, I was going to start with a quiz on uh, a little about national labs because here uh, we are a national lab. So we are <clears throat> owned and operated by the University of California. Um, but we are one of how many, how, 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 does anybody remember how many national labs there are? There's 17, 17 national labs. So you might be familiar with Pacific Northwest National Lab, uh, the Oak Ridge National Lab, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Sandia, Los Alamos. So the national labs are, all, are operated by the US Department of Energy. And we're one of the oldest national labs. We're, we have a history here in high energy physics. So uh, the particle accelerator was invented by Ernest Lawrence. Um, who was a, a researcher at UC Berkeley, and they needed more room, so they moved up the hill. So this is not the best place for a lot of these things because we do have earthquakes, but we have a nice view, so people are happy to come and hope you uh, enjoy the view today. Uh, the rain should be stopping, and as you know, uh, we're very fortunate to be up here at, uh, above the UC Berkeley campus. So we're one of the most unique labs in, uh, uh, we're a science-based lab. So we're known for work in materials and biology and high energy physics, cosmology. Uh, but here in the buildings world, we do what's called applied research. So we work with the US Department of Energy on something called energy efficiency and renewable energy. And energy efficiency has been a activity here since the oil embargo. So after the oil embargo, a guy named Art Rosenfeld, who was a high energy physicist, he was an Enrico Fermi's grad student working on particles. And he saw that uh, if we could reduce the need to import energy, we could be more secure. Our energy systems could be more secure if we imported less foreign oil. So that was the initial impetus for our work was national security, which is still relevant today. We still have things going on in the Middle East. So, so um, energy efficiency is uh, a, an important piece of the U.S. energy policy, and it's been one of the most cost-effective investments by the U.S. Department of Energy. The Appliance Standards Program, which rates refrigerators and water heaters and dishwashers, has staved over half a trillion dollars to the U.S. consumer. So what we do here is we actually help rate the performance of appliances and the most inefficient ones are, not, not, are illegal, kind of like miles per gallon on cars. So we do the research that helps um, help us create more efficient appliances and building codes. Uh, so today you're going to hear a lot about energy efficiency. And uh, we have a, a great set of speakers for you today. Um, you will then be going down to the UC Berkeley campus for dinner. Uh, to something called the Faculty House, Faculty Club, which was a Julia Morgan a building, a, a beautiful shingled uh, building at the UC Berkeley campus. So um, I hope you have a, a great time today. Uh, I also want to make a comment a little about the grid, and I'll be talking this afternoon about how the electric grid is changing. So I mentioned that national security was one of the reasons that the US Department of Energy has invested in energy efficiency. Uh, but one of the other things that we care about is uh, uh, the environment and energy efficiency. Building, there are three sectors that use energy, uh, transportation, buildings, and industry. And buildings are actually the largest of the energy users, about 40% of the energy and 40% of the carbon. So the initial impetus, as I mentioned, was um, security. But the environmental benefits of energy efficiency are also something that we are valuing more and more as we think about climate change and energy policy and the goals. And each state has different goals. Here in California, I'll talk a little about some of those this afternoon, but we have very aggressive renewable goals. And I'll be talking about the fact that as we change the way we supply energy, we want to change the way we consume energy and get the supply and the demand more integrated. And that's a big challenge because energy efficiency has been, um, the, the California has been spending a billion dollars a year on energy efficiency programs that the utilities deploy. And those programs pay for 
you know, lighting retrofits have been the big thing for decades. Lighting retrofits um, going from uh, incandescent to fluorescent and now fluorescent to LEDs. But uh, those technologies are becoming much cheaper and the utilities don't need to subsidize that anymore. It's become a transformed market, which utility programs are trying to do. So there's a lot of, of different activities now that the energy utilities are thinking about to try to encourage energy efficiency. If the buildings use less energy, we don't have to build as many power plants. So California was going to build uh, a series of nuclear power plants around the time of the oil embargo. We had a big plan for nuclear. But then we realized that um, nuclear energy has uh, uh, it often costs more than the original estimates because of all the waste disposal and uh, all kind of safety issues associated with it. So we, we actually made major investments in energy efficiency. And again, I'll show you some of that data uh, this afternoon. Uh, but it's, a, it's an exciting time in the energy world and in buildings. And buildings continue to be one of the most important uh, sources of clean technology. So, so it's kind of funny to think about buildings as clean tech, but there's a lot of clean tech startups in the building sector, uh, and we'll be talking about some of those technologies today. So I think um, we're going to go ahead and get started with the next speaker, but before I uh, turn it over to Jessica, um, do you have any questions for us? Oh, I, I didn't say this is the seventh. This is the seventh workshop we've had with Laney College and the uh, Best Center. So we want to really thank the National Science Foundation who sponsors our work, and uh, Laney and the other partners from around the country. And we really, we really love having you here because you are the people we're doing our work for. Uh, we know that the technology we develop here, if people don't understand how to use it, it doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. So we, let me, let me actually say a few more words about what we do do, which I haven't really told you. So we do work in appliance standards that I mentioned to you. We do work in Windows and you're going to hear a talk about something called the thin triple. Uh, we do work in uh, simulation. So we actually model buildings, and we have tools to enter, estimate the energy use and then estimate the energy savings from various retrofits. So as you change out the HVAC system from, say, a, uh, a change of the COP of the system, how much energy over the year might that save? Uh, we do a lot of work in fault diagnostics, and you're going to hear some of that today because I am happy to say that control systems were never good performance monitoring tools, but we're getting much better at being able to trend the data and understand what the HVAC system is doing. And you're gonna, for those of you who were here yet, last year, we spent a lot of time on the data in this building and all the problems with it, because our buildings have problems just like all the other buildings have problems. Um, and we, as scientists, are trying to collect the trend log data to help understand uh, the, you know, is the valve stuck? Is the damper working correctly? Is the VFD working? Is the temperature working? Is there simultaneous heating and cooling? So we'll be talking about some of that. So we don't work on fault diagnostics. Uh, we also do work on whole building systems, a lot of integrated retrofit work on residential and commercial. You're going to hear about ventilation and health. And here, uh, we've had a lot of smoke, not this year, but in previous years. So we're actually thinking about how do you control buildings during these extreme smoke events? And if you live in Australia, I'm sure you would be thinking about this also, is can we actually uh, run the building like a submarine and have no outside air coming in? So there is actually technologies that do that. And you might think about here in California changing the filters in the fall for more particle uh, uh, cleanliness uh, and, and running the schools a little different in the fall than we do the rest of the year because of the threat of smoke. So helping people understand what they can do and what they should do when there's extreme smoke is, is a very new thing for us in the HVAC industry. And I believe future building codes may think about that. Uh, future building codes may also think about resiliency. My power was out for two days here, and my friend came and he charged my refrigerator with this Nissan Leaf. And he has an inverter and special, uh, special cords uh, that he, I was able to run my refrigerator for a couple of hours and uh, manage some uh, food spoilage issues. Um, he also, I have, a, I have an on-demand gas water heater. And if you put, I have a, a car with a, one of those little a cigarette lighter. And if you put an inverter into that, I was able to turn on and get a hot shower. 
uh, because I needed 50 watts to turn on that on-demand water heater, and I could do that with, a, with an inverter connected to a car. So uh, that is not a big subject, but I think next year uh, we will have Christian talk about, we've given some seminars here about things you can do, and resiliency is one of the new research issues for us as we think about climate change, extreme heat, extreme cold, um, power outages, smoke. Uh, these are things that we haven't been, uh, they're not core to energy efficiency, but they're one of the new value propositions. If you put in, if you have a building uh, that's more comfortable when the power's been out for 24 hours than one that's not, uh, there's some benefit in the energy efficiency technologies with this resilience concept. And in the LEED program where you rate buildings, they're actually giving points for something called passive survivability. So how does a building perform when the power's out? So then a well-insulated building with mass is better than one with a, I have R1 uh, windows in my office, you know, so, so it's quite cold when, when it's, we have leaks in the windows and things like that. And here in Berkeley, that's not a big deal. It's a big deal in Milwaukee. Uh, so so um, I think I'll, I'll stop there. And actually, before I introduce Jessica again, any questions about today? Any thoughts or comments? So, uh, you're saying you're going to apply modeling. You also verify your models? Absolutely. Can, can, we're going to use this mic for questions yeah, yeah, okay. so we, so we yeah. can record. So, so uh, we... You, you, do, you, do, uh, you said you do modeling, and I just wondered if you verified your models. Right. So uh, there are several ways we verify the models. One is uh, NIST in, in Maryland, the National Institute of Standards and Testing. They actually have a test chambers where some of these, there's called a, there, there are specific tests for energy modelers where they have to be able to model like a residential scale, a small, a small building, and, and very many, ASHRAE, uh, runs these programs where you actually validate the models. So working with NIST and, and ASHRAE, we validate models. We also have something called FlexLab here, which um, we, didn't, we didn't take you over there, but it's a set of side-by-side -side test beds. And the test beds are, uh, they're about the size of this room, a little bit smaller, and they're commercial building scale test beds. And we have one where we're actually modeling something called Energy Plus, which is the model we use. Janie? Okay, yeah, so, so we do, we do uh, and then we're in real buildings. We, we, uh, uh, yeah, and as you know, real buildings don't have the measurements. We, we, in FlexLab, we have, we have sensors in the floors and sensors in the walls and sensors in the ducts and sensors on the inside and the outside of the window. So in real buildings, we, we may have a harder time knowing where the heat flow is going. You know? And if you use an infrared camera and you kind of look around the room, um, you can kind of see where there may be, uh, from the outside, you can see where the heat leakage is. Um, and then from the inside, you can again see the cold spots and the hot spots. So infrared cameras are good ways to figure out um, heat flow, but these are difficult things to model. Airflow is very difficult to uh, measure. Uh, so we do work on airflow and, and we'll be talking about that. Any other questions? Okay, again, thanks for coming. Uh, we hope you have a great day. Um, and we look forward to the question and answers after the talks, and uh, uh, we look forward to your feedback at the end of the event as well.